Good day to you. I'm wearing a Floods t-shirt. You know, I have some history with Floods, my wife and I, but at that time, my girlfriend back in the 90s, our first place living in East Stroudsburg was in an apartment above Floods. And we used to go down there for burgers. And then afterwards, we'd go back up to the apartment. And one of the reasons I chose that place was so that we didn't have to get in a car and drive if we went to a place like Floods and had some beers. Of course, today, that's not really as much of a problem because people get into cars as part of Uber and Lyft and Didi and all the other services that are out there as part of what are, we are now calling a sharing economy. And that sharing economy stretches far and wide across our social interactions today as when people go on spring break and they stay in an Airbnb. I myself am staying in Airbnbs quite regularly. I'm staying in one this summer in Copenhagen. And so this sharing economy is something that is happening for many of us. But what is it really like from a Fuchsian standpoint, if I can say things that way, as our author is really now claiming his own territory in the area of neo-Marxist analysis, if you want to call it that, new, that's what neo means. And we're going to take that on today in the sharing economy as we stretch beyond social media in some ways to talk about a dimension of life that impacts our social media use. And that's really what Fuchs has set out to do in his book. It's, it's going beyond just the economics. We are studying the political economy of social media, if I can remind us all of that, as we start to get into dimensions of our lives now that have an economic and political impact on the way that we think about our relations with each other. So we know for a start that everybody needs to get around. And it is generally a really good thing to be able to hop in an Uber or a Lyft as opposed to driving while you're drinking or as opposed to having to have a car in a big city or as opposed to an elderly person only using a car once in a while to go to a grocery store. We, we saw that those kinds of things are very, very good. And that's why you have an Uber, which started in 2009 in San Francisco. And it just fits right in with the whole sharing idea that's come about because of Facebook and the rest of the social media branding that has taken place, that sharing is good. It is, as Fuchs says, positively connoted. You know that word, connoted? Connotation is positively connoted. But notice, however, that sharing should also theoretically include sharing in ownership, should it not? If you're making money for a company, shouldn't you... Theoretically, if sharing is tried and true and deep and broad, you should be sharing an ownership, but that's not what's going on in Uber or Airbnb or the sharing economy in general. There's another business that's mentioned here you may not know about called Upwork. Upwork is where freelancers go and they hire out their services. Could be from editing resumes to inputting data. And um, Fuchs shows, along with the Uber driver, that they don't make hardly any money they make enough to pay for the things that they have, but they're not really making surplus money. We'll talk more about that later. Let's get in now to the capitalist sharing economy and how it works. This capitalist sharing economy, as Fuchs calls it, approximately 20 to 25 percent of the the uh, Approximately 20 to 25% of a fare that you pay in Uber goes to Uber the company and not to the driver. So the driver's getting anywhere from 75 to 80% of that $1 that you get for every $1 that you spend. In other words, the driver is selling their labor, but at a profit to the Uber company by collecting that 20 to 25%. In the meantime, the driver is investing in the car. And in the maintenance of the car, and we all know what maintenance for cars is like, especially when that dreaded check engine light comes on. And then you also have oil and gas that you're paying for and other kind of liquids for wiper fluid. And a lot of times that's not factored into the to the driver's profits. And, and so they're making less than they think. So to revert to Marx now, we haven't mentioned directly, I think in a couple classes, Marx points out that a true capitalist, if you're really buying into the system of capitalism, a true capitalist is not somebody who participates in the process of production. A true capitalist is just the person who is making the decisions about the capital accumulation because they're the ones with the capital. You know, I was in South Carolina not too long ago for a wedding and they talk about old money down there, old money that was acquired during, frankly, slavery time periods. And that money has been passed on from generation to generation and it has given rise to whole generations of families who did not work at all. 
they were known as gentlemen back in the day before those kinds of of uh, p positions in our society and histories were examined under social justice perspectives. But yeah, they were people who were true capitalists, right? But but Marx says, no, no, an Uber driver cannot be because an Uber driver is participating in the process of production and all the social media that goes around with that in terms of ratings of the Uber driver. So you don't have true capitalism going on here, and yet many Uber drivers believe that they are entrepreneurs. Many Airbnb owners believe that they are self-starters, entrepreneurs. We'll talk more about that because it takes a certain amount of capital to become that true entrepreneur where you become a capitalist. You're no longer sitting behind that draw, that wheel for 12 hours a day. And so think about that. Think about how we fail to realize that. And many of you in this class, I'm sure, have either driven with uh, as an Uber or Lyft driver or you have family members or friends who are. Now let's talk about the, the models that are at play here, the capitalistic models that are at play for a sharing economy. The first one is the rent model. The rent model, that's where the company owns the thing it is that you're renting, bicycles, I've ridden electric bicycles in lots of places, in Portugal, for example. I've seen them just last weekend when I was walking around down in uh, Pennsylvania at a big city. There are rental bikes all over. Bird Bicycles is one of the companies that owns them. Cars, of course, you can rent cars. There are cars that you can rent, electric cars for one hour, two hours. Cars. I have friends that just did a private rental of a convertible for somebody while we were at a conference in Florida. There's all kinds of rentals that go on, but the key here is the rent model is by companies or owners, and they, they rent it out to customers. And essentially what the customer is doing is paying for temporary temporary use. And so another way to look at that from a Fuchsian standpoint is that Uber and all the other companies that do this, that rent out these things, Bird for electric bicycles, they're actually reducing the profit for the people who are producing the services. That is the people who are maintaining the, the bicycles that you're renting out, the people who are sitting behind that car wheel. Those are the people who are producing the labor, right? And so Uber is really reducing their profits. So there is there is a set of contradictions that comes up in Uber capitalism, if you want to call it that. Contradiction is a big word. It's a big word in Marxian criticism of capitalism. There are contradictions that exist that we don't see. That's the purpose of this class. One is the contradiction between a traditional business economy and a sharing economy. A, a traditional business economy and a sharing economy, what happens to hotels? What happens to taxis? When you introduce Airbnb, when you introduce Uber, taxi drivers, loss of income, taxi driving companies providing health care benefits, providing a secure employment, providing sick leave, those, those companies, they're threatened. Now, some may say, well, you know what? They just became too big and unwieldy anyhow, and there's too much overhead. So Uber, good job. Uber getting the price down for taxi companies. And you would be right, but think about the fact that Uber drivers, they don't have minimum wage. They do not have health care. They do not have paid holidays. They do not have sick pay. These are basic working rights so that people are not working 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. A second contradiction is you have people who are driving these vehicles who consider themselves to be self-employed, but are they? Because the alternative is, are you a worker? What's the difference? Are you self-employed or are you a worker for somebody else? Are you an employee? If you're self-employed, you call all the shots, right? But that's not the case in Uber. You have a whole bunch of rules and regulations. I took a ride with an Uber driver in Florida. He was really upset because he was pulled over by police in North Carolina for camping gear, and he refused to have his car searched. So he says they threw him into jail, and now he needs to get that cleared because Uber driver says you cannot have a single blemish on your record. Why they threw him in jail, I don't know, but it speaks to Uber having control over the driver, even for something that occurred in another state. And Uber has all these mechanisms for rating Uber drivers that, that influence how an Uber driver is going to be used. So these people are not self-employed. They are working for a company, Uber, Airbnb, Upwork, all of them. Let's go on. Oh, by the way, and the earnings of Uber drivers on average, according to Fuchs Research, were $11.00. And 15 cents per hour. $11 and 15 cents per hour. Think about that. It's another contradiction, right? That it's seemingly a job where you can really be a self starter, cut out the middle person, make some money, bringing people home from floods, but $11 and 15 cents after you take out your expenses. 
Now let's go into the second model for sharing in the sharing economy. It's a freemium model. You know this model well, right? I have students all the time talking about, here's how you cancel your Netflix subscription or your Spotify, Spotify subscription or your Pandora. And why should you have to think like that, right? It's because of the freemium model. It's because you're being sucked in, in many cases, to a paid service by joining it first because it's free or because the basic service is free. And then you're like, I can't stand these commercials on Pandora. I'm just going to pay the monthly fee. And then I listened to it a lot for these three months. And you know what? I haven't listened in about nine months. I forgot about it, but it's still coming out of my checking account. That's how the freedom, uh, the freemium model works. And the reason that it's, it's attractive, Fuchs says, to introduce another dimension to this, which we may not otherwise think about. Why is this attractive? Why are people attracted to freemium services and to the previous services I discussed under the rent model? It's because people have low wages. People have low wages. Maybe not so much now. In fact, we could see a change that actually threatens a lot of Fuchs thinking because after the pandemic, there's a worker shortage. Shortage. And actually, companies are paying some of the highest salaries that they paid in a while, hourly and hourly wages included, because there's a shortage of workers. So there is a change here somewhat in Fuchs. Uh, in the economics of Fuchs' book, but at the same time, it's also the case that people don't believe they're paid enough to cope with their loans, their their car costs, gas prices, car insurance, car maintenance, all the things that go along with cars, is it groceries, rent, cell phone bills. And so we turn to a sharing economy. That's the way we save money. That's what's really driving it, Fuchs says. Now let's go into the third model of the sharing economy. It's, it's called the rent on rent model. This is where Airbnb comes more into the, the picture. It's where you, you rent on rent. And the way that it works is you rent from this person and then you can rent other kinds of services too. Like if you rent on Uber, that's what you're doing, right? You're renting an apartment. You're also offered services for renting a car, services for borrow my doggy if you want to have your dog walked or if you want to walk somebody else's dog. Right? So it's kind of like upselling. You can think of it that way. Spinster is another one. That's for bicycle renter if you rent an, uh, an Airbnb. Meanwhile, Airbnb is charging 3% for putting all this together, for producing nothing, nothing except putting together people who have apartments and shops that have bicycles for rental with people who want to rent those things. Same as Facebook, same as Twitter, same as Instagram, same as TikTok, right? So this is the sharing economy, 3%. And for the person doing the renting, they're paying a six to 15% booking fee. Every time you rent a bicycle or via Uber, just like Travelocity, you'll book an airline flight and then they'll ask if you want a car, same thing. And if the renter happens to be a worker, a worker for that company, as a lot of people do, they take advantage of discounts, then the rent is actually coming out of the worker's wages. So think about that, it's a reduction in wages. All right, now we're gonna to turn to a classic Marxian term, which you may think of as a sexual term. It has been applied in a sexual context, but not here, it's called commodity fetishism. Commodity fetishism, fetish, fetish, fetishism. So you know what a fetish is? That's what we think of as sexual, right? You have like an unhealthy sexual appetite. We think of that as a fetish. That's actually derived from commodity fetishism. So what, it's, what is it all about? It comes from Marx's Capital, his work called Capital, Volume 1. There are more than one volume. And it's a bunch of things together, but basically what it's saying is, is our human activity is, is instrumentalized by capital accumulation. And that's a big insult. Our human activity is instrumentalized. It is, it is reduced. All of our human endeavors are reduced to being an instrument for nothing more than facilitating capital accumulation. Our relations with waiters and waitresses. Our relations with bosses. Our relations with the Wawa person that we purchase something from. Because of the mechanism of tipping, the mechanism of profit making, the mechanism of a branding and of everything else we've been talking about in this class, Human activity is instrumentalized. And part of that process involves the creation of use values. That is saying what's important in life is using things to satisfy human needs and to also get people to relate to each other. That's why we have terms like retail therapy. That's a term that's invented that's part of capital accumulation to get people to think, you know what, I've had a fight with my boyfriend or girlfriend. I'm going to go shopping. I'm going to feel better by buying something. That's a use value. I took a walk with a 24-year-old black guy I was meeting for the first time as part of a dinner invitation in Easton. 
I'm 60 years old. And as I was walking along the path, I'm saying to myself, I'm not going to be asking any questions about what he's wearing to get the conversation started. I want to talk about what we're passing. And it happened to be an artwork nature trail. So yeah, we had a conversation that was not organized. First time people meeting each other, first time noticing each other, first time talking to each other, first time trying to find common interests or what possibilities exist. And it was not organized around, oh, what are you wearing? What brand is that? Where did you shop last night? What's the restaurant that you ate at? What do you like to buy? It wasn't organized around that. And that's, I think, a pretty rare kind of conversation, I have to say. And I mention it in the context of a disparate age range and race to try and create a context of the kinds of conversations that can occur and should occur in life. But how are they organized? Are they instrumentalized as something to do with accumulating capital. That's what I'm saying here. People are socialized also at the workplace. That's where people meet their spouses at the workplace. That's where they connect. And they talk about their use values. People start bragging about the latest car that they bought, about the vacation that they're taking, about the outrageous meal that they ate at, about the concert that they went to. These are use values that are embedded in capitalism and commodity fetishism. It's it's a, it's getting us to focus on commodities rather than really understanding how our lives are being organized by a cap by a capital accumulation economic model but mark says it's worse than that because social the social quality of capitalism that i've just been speaking about is actually subsumed under a larger endeavor and that is to create a class society where you have a permanent poor class and a permanent rich class that's what Function. That's what feeds capitalism. That's how it works. If you don't have that, then you're not going to have that desire for capital accumulation. And so you need to preserve that. It's another contradiction in the system. Everybody can be rich. No, everybody cannot be rich in a capitalist model. And so in a capitalist model and a sharing economy, you do not have direct relations between the producers and the consumers. And how ironic is that? Because sharing is promoted as, oh, you're going to stay in an Airbnb and you really get to know the neighborhood of this town in this country or this neighborhood or this state that you've never been to. No, you don't. You show up, you get a key from a lockbox, you go and you stay there, you leave, you hope you don't damage anything. Hopefully the owner doesn't know what really went on in there. There's not a lot of interaction. It's not like a B&B. You know what a B&B is, right? If you ever stayed in one, probably not. It's not really geared towards your de your demographic, but maybe you have. That's where you get breakfast. The owners come down and talk to you. I've stayed in a few B&Bs. I almost don't even say the word anymore. Airbnb comes out. I've stayed in a few B&Bs, bed, bed, bed and breakfast over the years, and they're quite charming. They can be. They're, you know, you have a certain loss of privacy, but it's a different experience. It's what sharing really is about, right? It's not really the sharing economy that we're talking about here today. And so the Airbnb experience really offers an exchange between the guest and the owner that's impersonal. It's totally impersonal. And so money is really the means for organizing trust between people in a sharing economy. You tip a person, they trust you. You pay the fee up front, they trust you. You have a good credit history and rating on Uber and Lyft and Airbnb. People trust you. It's money rather than behavior, pure behavior that is gaining the trust of people. And so we end now with the idea of a financial and economic crisis as being endemic to capitalism. It's one of the, one of the contradictions, the biggest contradiction perhaps of all in capitalism and a contradiction we'll be exploring in successive chapters. And that is that capitalism is supposed to be this engine of permanent economic growth and provides wealth and prosperity to everybody, right? But why do we have these recessions? Why did we have 2007 when the value of my house dropped by 50%? People were out of work. People were paid very poorly. There was a big depression. A lot of people lost their houses. It was mainly a housing crisis that lasted for a good five, six, seven years. It was a it was a recession slash depression almost for a lot of people. A lot of suicides during that time period. The U.S. government ended up bailing out big businesses, big businesses they called too big to fail, like General Motors and some other auto manufacturing companies that were deemed if they fail, the U.S. economy was in jeopardy of failing. That's government involvement to bail out a capitalist crisis. Right? Think about that. So capitalism has in it these cycles 
of crisis. They, they always occur, occur because you always have a poor class in capitalism. And the poor class is always going to be at the focus of turbulence in society because they're looking at rich classes, right? And so when we look at a sharing economy, we have consumers that are seeking these sharing services because they have debt, student debt. They have a lack of time. They're working two or three jobs and going to school so they don't have the time to sit and really meet people and share with them naturally. They have no housing, either on vacation or for long-term stays so people are using Airbnb for temporary housing. But Airbnb doesn't pay hotel tax. Airbnbs located in neighborhoods gobble up properties that otherwise could be going to young homeowners. Do you know what it would be like today to be 25 and buying a home? The prices are astronomical in East Stroudsburg. You try to buy a house now, and immediately they stop the bidding and say, we're going to take the highest bid, and it's going to be over the asking price in most cases. It's just crazy now. Is that because of Airbnb only? No, it's not only because of that. Is Airbnb helping young homeowners? No, they are not. So the sharing economy, according to Fuchs, and maybe also now yourself, is not all it is cracked up to be. But that's for you to decide. Have a great day.